start with Second Peter, but we're not even going to look at Second Peter in a way. Um, to talk about some of the characteristics of it and, and look at a few other passages because Second Peter is one of the first of the, of the books of, in the New Testament. I mean, even though it's towards the end, it's one of those books that yells, it's got, it's got warning written all over it. Uh, one, of the, <clears throat> one of the books that we looked at is sort of a commentary written by uh, Warren Wearsby. The title of it is Be Alert. And it's, you could use other expressions, but on the handout it says, heads up. And with the, you know, the baseball playoffs going on, uh, <clears throat> I just thought it was interesting to, to use that, you know, it's a warning. There's a, there are a lot of warnings in the Bible, but first, I mean, Second Peter, and then a couple of other books uh, that we'll probably look at after Second Peter, uh, Second and Third John, and then um, <clears throat> the book of Jude, are all warnings, and they, they, they tell it like it is. It's, watch out for these guys because they are this, they're wrong, this is what their end is going to be, so don't go after them. That's it. And so it's, it's strong warnings. <clears throat> um, well, let's open up with a word of prayer this morning. <clears throat> Father, thank you for the time we have this morning, and all those who are gathered in the building here, I just pray that everyone would be, would be edified in some form or fashion, that our hearts would be yielded to what you would have for us um, <clears throat> in whatever we're hearing, whether it's the message from pastor um, or the Sunday school classes or perhaps a, something that someone has to share this morning. Now, I just pray that you, again, that you'd be with us, that you pray for those who can't be here in person and just ask the Lord for, for health and comfort, peace and safety for them as well. Now, I, again, it's just ask for your blessing on our time together here. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So, so if everyone has a handout, you know, this is this a handout says, someone, you're at a baseball game, someone yells, heads up. And why do they yell that? Because chances are something's going on that could hurt somebody in the stands. But typically, it's a foul ball. Um, so, and that's a fair warning for something that could hurt somebody. So it's a, you know, heads up. And what Peter does in the second letter is he sounds, he sounds a warning for things that can hurt believers and things that can hurt churches. And <clears throat> so, well, what do most people, a lot of times you're at a ball game and somebody else heads up. And it, this may be subject to debate by some people, but last time we were at a Pelicans game and there was, a, you know, you hear the, the bat hits the ball and you hear crack. Somebody yells, heads up. What I did, what a lot of people around me did, you cover up. Heads up. I'm not going to look and see what's coming. I want to just cover up, so you know, just and then you just sort of cover up, and then ah, it's all done. You know, you just sort of you don't really pay attention to what's going on. So almost nobody looks for the danger and tries to avoid it. You just it's just sort of cover up and just hope nothing happens. <clears throat> Every day we see stuff on TV. You see stuff in the news. You, you just well, or maybe it's a TV show that you watch, entertainment stuff on the internet, you can look at and hear all kinds of things. You know, the, the world has its own message that it wants you to hear, and there are people who claim to be profession, professing Christians who have a message they want you to hear. And they want you to pay attention to it because, you know, they have some sort of credibility or whatever. But uh, <clears throat> some of these are exactly the people that Peter, and then later on John and, and Jude, are going to call scoffers, and, you know, that's what they, that's what they call them. Um, <clears throat> a question about foul ball. In some cases, what's the difference between a foul ball and a home run? No. And it's not the music, you know, we're not going to sing the Star Spangled Banner, right? Okay. But anyways, what's the, the foul ball? The foul pole, but 
If you ever, <clears throat> back in, I think it was 1975, <clears throat> the Red Sox were playing Cincinnati, I think. I think it was 75. And Carlton Fisk, the catcher for the Red Sox, hit, a, hit the ball way off into left field. And it was, looked like it was gonna, couldn't tell. And he's running down the first baseline, waving his arms like this. He wants it to stay fair. And it did. It just, it, here's the foul pole. The ball went just to the, just to the right side of the foul pole. Home run, tied the game, you know, hero. They lost the next game, but that's beside the point. <laughs> but, uh, so, the, you know, the difference between, if, <clears throat> you remember that, don't you? <clears throat> the, uh, so, I mean, the difference between what somebody says and what the Bible says can be really close. But a foul ball is a strike. No, any way you look at it, it's foul. I don't care how far you hit it, it could go out of the park foul. It's still a strike. So, what good is a foul ball? Not much. Um, <clears throat> so, it was Second Peter is said to be part of the dark. It's called part of the dark corner of the New Testament. New Testament because it's not taught very often. Um, it's not one of those things you see studied very often. Uh, it's not quoted very often, and a lot of liberal teachers sort of dislike the, the book of Second Peter uh, because, <clears throat> you know, for obvious reasons, it calls people out, and, and that's that's exactly what it does. Our old pastor up north uh, taught, uh, preached messages on Second Peter, and one of the, in his first message he said there are three things that liberal theologians don't like about Second Peter. Chapter 1, chapter 2, and chapter 3. <laughs> so, <clears throat> but so it seems that, although, you know, it seems like, though, like, sometimes people will do the same things um, with Scripture, with warnings in Scripture, as you do at a ball game. You hear the warning, you read it, and you just sort of, you duck and cover, like when someone yells heads up at the ball game, um, rather than listening to the warning. So, do we balance our time with what we hear and what we see on TV or on the internet with good, solid Bible reading. If you hear something a preacher says, uh, you know, the Bereans went back and double-checked. Do you, do you double-check what somebody says sometimes? I mean, or do you, when you think about it, I was talking with, a pastor preached a message um, from Nehemiah. And I asked him, I, I, when he was done, I said, I hadn't heard, I said, I know you preached on this once before, a long time ago. And I've never heard anybody else take the, you know, the position that you have. I said, well, when you read about it, when you read other parts of Scripture, you know, what you said makes sense. So sometimes if someone says something you know, that just goes along with everybody else, maybe you need to double check it. Um, so it, check out Scripture, you know. So anyways, do you read the whole counsel of God? Sometimes we have our, our favorite parts that we like to look at in the Bible. And you sort of look at them, and you read them, and you keep going back to them. Psalms are wonderful, um, but there are warnings in Psalms as well. Um, you know, the, the Gospel of John is wonderful. There's warnings in there too, but a lot of times people will focus on, you know, God is love, the love of God, and and, and that's and that's all true. But Hebrews says our God is a consuming fire, and so there's there's some there's some balance that we need to have. Um, <clears throat> There's on the second page on the on the handout. There's a little picture there. <clears throat> I don't know. If, I don't know if any anybody here from New England. <laughs> a minority, to be sure. And I don't know if anyone remembers this. Uh, in August seventh, nineteen eighty-two, Jim Rice um, went grabbed a boy out of the stands. What happened was the opposing player. I think they were playing the White Sox. Hit a foul ball. It was one of those that went off his back, went straight into the stands, and it hit the kid and hit this little kid on the head. Well, Jim Rice heard some commotion going on. He came out of the dugout, and he saw this little boy bleeding profusely from his head. So he jumps up into the stands, grabs the boy, takes him down to the doctors in the dugout, and the doctors treated him, put him in the ambulances that's always there waiting for players to get hurt, took him to the hospital where he was treated, and there was no brain damage because he was treated so quickly. So, and he would have died. The doctor said, Jim Rice saved his life. But, you know, sometimes you see something like that and you wonder, how did that happen? Did someone 
yellow warning and nobody listened. And, and I'm not saying that that's, that's what happened. Um, <clears throat> so when you think about it, if you can duck and cover if you want to, but when somebody hits a hard foul ball, someone hits something, it's gonna hit what it's gonna hit. And you can cover your head with your hands all you want. That's not gonna block anything when it comes to a foul ball. The same is true with, with people who twist scripture and who promote lies and, and their own agenda with what they want you to hear and what they want you to believe. So just think about, you know, if, if the consequences of being hit by a baseball can be so, so severe as what happened to this little boy, think, think about the spiritual consequences of the, of the duck and cover mentality when it comes to warnings. Um, <clears throat> so anyways, <clears throat> Peter, John, Jude, all issue warnings, d very short books in the Bible, easy to look at and just flip through, especially uh, second and third John and then Jude. Uh, not even, I mean, you count the verses, you don't count the chapters. That's how short they are. Second Peter may take a little longer, but still, the collective message is huge. There are so many warnings, and it's just stuff that we need to have, we, we need it. Uh, <clears throat> and it follows a pattern of warnings in the Bible. If you go back and look at Moses, there's lots and lots of warnings in the Bible. Oh, and we're going to look at look at more of that. But um, one of the person, one of the people that warned others in the Bible was Jesus. And who better to listen to? Um, Mark thirteen thirty seven. He says, "And what I say unto you, I say unto all: Watch." It's and it's a kind of watch as not like in you know you sit down and you watch a movie on TV that you've seen four hundred and thirty times. You watch. No, it's watch, as in, you know, keep your eyes peeled because something's going on. Um, Bobby went to bed, <clears throat> and I was, I was going through making some notes here, and the TV was on. The movie was on. We have Eagles Dare. Richard Burton, um, Clint Eastwood. It was a World War II movie. I've seen it. Did I watch the movie? Sort of. <laughs> it's one of those things, so was I watching? Uh, yes and no, but uh, anyways, that verse, that verse, you know, the, uh, follows a long warning from the, from the Lord in Mark 13, which starts at verse 5, where it says, he says, Take heed lest any man deceive you. Take heed lest any man deceive you. So that's what people are up to do. Maybe that's their agenda. Maybe they just don't know any better. It doesn't make any difference. If they're straying from the Bible, it's wrong. So, so why the warnings? Why do people give warnings in the Bible? Why are there things? Why do we? Why does somebody? You know, why does somebody yell heads up in a game? Because they care. Typically, one of the reasons is love. Okay, it's easy to see why Jesus will warn his disciples and us. Um, no one has loved them more than the Lord did. No one loves us more than Jesus does. Um, but others love their subjects in, in their writings too. And <clears throat> they love their subjects, but they also love the Lord as well because they knew what he, they knew his word and they wanted to impart it to others. So uh, <clears throat> one of the ideas is when someone writes a warning in the Bible, it's almost like they're saying, you know, how can we ignore what God has done for us? Let's listen, listen to this warning. You can't ignore this, please don't. You know, they're, they're, just, they're just urging that. So, you think about it. You question, what parting words would you have for someone, someone that you hold dearest? You know, if you, you know, a lot of, a lot of times people will leave, a, or will leave a long letter and say, you know, oh, you know, to my such and such, to my wife, you know, please remember this, please remember this. What would you write? And this is kind of like what Moses does. It's kind of, what Peter does and so forth. And, and uh, so think about what you would write to someone who's dear to you um, in terms of warning. You might say something very comfortable. You might give them encouragement. You might, something like that. But most of us would say, you know, you've got to watch out. Or maybe there's somebody in your family that should say, watch out for Uncle Bob because, you know, he's a, he's a trickster. You know, he's, 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 you know, all he's going to want to do is take your money from you or something like that. You, stuff like this, this, things like that. But uh, um, one of the other reasons, because the 
folks who wrote, who were authors of the Bible, were moved by the Holy Ghost. Um, and they, they want to impart, the Holy Ghost wants to impart truth, <clears throat> and an absolute truth. And contrary, and this is one of the things that a couple of the, the commentaries that I was reading talked about, everyone has their own truth. Every, that's the way the world is today. What's, if it's true for you, then it's okay. That's your truth. No, it's not. <laughs> it's not okay. Um, <clears throat> you know, Peter, especially when you think about it, he was a witness to truth when the Lord declared, the Lord said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. Peter heard him say that. Peter heard him say, and ye shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. Truth. There's, there's not, there is truth, and there are near truths. But anything that's not the truth must not be the truth at all. So, does that sound right? If it's if it's off, kind of like a foul ball. If it's if it's if it hits hit the left field and it's just to the left of the foul pole, yeah, it's not a home run. That's a foul ball. And like I say, it could go out of the park, but it's still a foul ball. Strike two. Okay. Um, <clears throat> one of the commentaries also said. Too easily lost in this atmosphere of easygoing tolerance is a concern for truth. Hmm, too easily lost in this atmosphere of easygoing tolerance is a concern for truth. Anybody agree with that or does anybody disagree with that? So, you know, and that was true, that was true back in, back when Peter wrote, it was true back when Moses wrote, so for thousands of years it's been true. And like Solomon wrote in Ecclesiastes, there's nothing new under the sun. It's, it's the same old thing. One of the other reasons for, for writing these things, you know, every now and then you need, you need someone to wake you up. You need a wake-up call. And it's nice to hear the encouragement. Um, it's nice to hear the blessings. It's nice to hear instructions. But every now and then you need to wake up and smell the coffee because something's going wrong and somebody needs to pay attention. Um, you need these things. Rejection of authority. It's nothing new, but we see it now more than ever. How many, how many times are, do schools teach obey your parents? I don't know. I've been in school for a long time, but I don't think they do a lot of that. Any younger folks here? Do you hear obey your parents from anywhere but church, perhaps? Not really, but that's but that's a truth. And every now and then you have to hear, you know, you need to obey. You need to obey your parents. Um, we need to hear. Don't go there. That's not right. It's just plain wrong. Don't do it. So you know, this is just some of the some of the reasons. You know, the people are people are writing these things. And I wanted to go through some examples of warnings in the Bible. You could turn to Deuteronomy, Deuteronomy chapter twenty-eight for, for a second here. The very beginning of Deuteronomy chapter 28, Moses starts <clears throat> um, with a promise of blessing and an urging to obey the voice of the Lord. Um, <clears throat> Moses writes, And it shall come to pass, if thou shalt hearken diligently unto the voice of the Lord thy God, to observe and to do all his commandments which I command thee this day, that the Lord thy God will set thee on high above thee all nations of the earth, and all these blessings shall come on thee and overtake thee, if thou shalt hearken unto, <clears throat> unto the voice of the Lord thy God. And he goes on, you know, through verse 14, you know, with blessing after blessing after blessing, and all, all these things that God's people can enjoy. So there's a warning there, but it's sort of a positive warning. It's a, it's a positive statement. Do this. Here's all these blessings. But then in Verse 15, he takes a turn, and here's a, here's a word of warning. Deuteronomy 28, 15, But it shall come to pass, if thou wilt not hearken unto the voice of the Lord thy God, to observe to do all his commandments and his statutes, which I command thee this day, that all these curses shall come upon thee and overtake thee. And he goes down through, you can, you can read it sometime if you want to, but down through the end of the chapter, verse 68, he went through 
you know, roughly 14 verses of blessings, and now you've got 68 minus 15, 53 verses of curses. If you don't hearken unto the voice of the Lord, watch out, he's saying. Heads up, folks. Something bad is going to happen if you don't do this. Um, <clears throat> then, then in chapter 30, Deuteronomy chapter 30, <clears throat> Moses gives it, it's almost, a, almost like a final urge, urging by him. Um, <clears throat> verses 19 and 20. He says, I call heaven and earth to record this day against you, that I have set before you life and death, blessing and cursing. Therefore, choose life that both thou and thy seed may live, that thou mayest love the Lord thy God, and that thou mayest obey his voice, and that thou mayest cleave unto him. For he is thy life and the length of thy days, that thou mayest dwell in the land which the Lord swear unto thy fathers, to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob, to give them. And what a, you know, what a tone to, the, to the, this passage. You know, this is, he's pleading and urging. He loves these people, even though these are the same people who attacked him, they disobeyed him, they undermined his authority, they frustrated him. But still, he speaks to them like a loving father. It's, you know, the urging here is, I call heaven and earth to record this day. Please choose life. And these, these are the things that he wants them to do. Um, <clears throat> in the book of Joshua, in Joshua chapter 24, Joshua gathers together all the people and reviews everything that's happened to God's people, both, you know, from uh, even back before, you know, they started conquering the land. And <clears throat> there's a point in time where he admonishes them in verses 14 and 15 of chapter 24. He writes, Now therefore, fear the Lord, and serve him in sincerity and in truth, and put away the gods which your fathers served on the other side of the flood, and in Egypt, and serve ye the Lord. And if it seem evil unto you to serve the Lord, choose you this day whom you will serve, whether the gods which your fathers served that were on the other side of the flood, or the gods of the Amorites in whose land ye dwell. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. And then he gives one final warning in verse 20. If ye forsake the Lord and serve strange gods, then he will turn and do you hurt and consume you after that he hath done you good. There's, there's a warning. If you forsake the Lord and go after other gods, something bad's going to happen. It's going to, and it is going to happen. And, you know, by the way, all this, all these things were part of the book of the book of the law that the people had with them because Moses had written these things down. And it says in verse 26, And Joshua wrote these words in the book of the law of God and took a great stone and set it up there under the oak that was by the sanctuary of the Lord. And in verse 27, And Joshua said unto all the people, Behold, this stone shall be a witness unto us, for it hath heard all the words of the Lord which he spake unto us. It shall be therefore a witness unto you, unless ye deny your God. So these things were there for the people. There was something there to remind them. They had a reminder. They had they had what had been written down, but they, they also had this uh, <clears throat> the uh, stone that he set up as a witness. So they could look at something and say, Yeah, we need to follow the Lord. We need to follow the Lord. Did they listen? Read the book of Judges, comes next. They really didn't listen very well, I don't think. But we'll talk a little bit more, more about that later. But, uh, um, David, <clears throat> he's a good he's a good one in 1 Kings chapter 2. <clears throat> David's talking to it's actually, we start in verse 1. Now the days of David drew nigh that he should die. And he charged Solomon his son, saying, I go the way of all the earth. Be thou strong before, and show thyself a man. And keep the charge of the Lord thy God, to walk in his ways, to keep his statutes, and his commandments, and his judgments, and his testimonies, as it is written in the law of Moses, that thou mayest prosper in all that thou doest, and whithersoever thou turn thyself. 
that the Lord may continue, continue his word, which he spake concerning me, saying, If thy children take heed to their way, to walk before me in truth, with all their heart and with all their soul, there shall not fail thee, said he, a man on the throne of Israel. <clears throat> so there was, a, there was a, a warning and a promise that, that, that David repeated for Solomon. So, did Solomon father follow his father's heads up warning? We'll, we'll talk a little bit more about that, about that later. But uh, um, <clears throat> if you fast forward to the New Testament in Second Timothy. In 2 Timothy, 10, 2 Timothy chapter 4, verses 1 through 5, Paul gives some final words of, of counsel to Timothy, and that they're full of loving pleadings here. He says, I charge thee therefore before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall judge the quick and the dead at his, at his appearing and his kingdom. Preach the word, be instant, in season, out of season. Reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but after their own lusts shall they heap to themselves teachers having itching ears. And they shall turn away their ears from the truth, and shall be turned unto fables. But watch thou in all things, endure afflictions, and do the work of an evangelist. Make full proof of thy ministry. So Paul is, is, is giving instructions to, Tim, to Timothy, and especially in verses 3 and 4. It's very close to what you're going to hear in 2 Peter, as well as Jude and John and so forth. Uh, very close, talking about those who, they're not going to put up with sound doctrine. They're not going to put up with the truth, because it's, sometimes it's inconvenient for them. And we know that Paul, uh, who studied in First and Second uh, Corinthians, we know that Paul had a lot had to deal with all kinds of either false teachers, opposition, people that were looking to put their own agenda forward ahead of what what Paul had, what Paul had from the Lord. It wasn't Paul's agenda. Paul's agendas, Paul's agenda and the Lord's were the same thing. So so he here he lays it out for Timothy. He says, This is what's gonna happen. People are gonna have those those itching ears. I don't want to hear that. I want to hear that or when, you know they're going to go off in a different direction. Um, so there's there's just a few examples here. <clears throat> just a couple questions. What were some of the things these writers had in common when they wrote their warnings? Well, first thing that occurred to me was these were all the last words because they died shortly thereafter. Um, Moses, that was literally one of the last things he said before he was called up um, <clears throat> to be taken home. To the Lord. Um, Paul, Paul was put to death shortly thereafter by Nero, who was beheaded. Joshua, it says that he, you know, shortly after that he, he died. David was on his deathbed already. So that's, <clears throat> so all these people, this is a, it's, they're all, it's a last ditch effort to protect what they've been entrusted with, what they know to be true. And I think, I think that's important. Um, one of the other things they have in common is experience. Think about, think about Moses. He'd just been through much. Moses was, at this point, 120 years old, and he had seen a lot. Um, <clears throat> Moses had, had the experience of disobeying the Lord when he hit the rock when he was supposed to speak to it. And then he knew there were consequences for what he did. So he, he knew you know, perfectly well and personally, I need to follow the Lord. I didn't, and so he's saying, you need to. Um, <clears throat> Joshua saw all this happen. Joshua saw what happened to the people of Israel after they believed the, you know, the bad report that the spies brought back, back in the old days. He saw what happened. David, okay, did David have anything in his life that taught him some lessons, some hard lessons? Yes. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. Um, David, David went through the ringer but to have his own son Absalom revolt against him, to have his daughter raped by one of his own sons, and then to have that son killed. I mean, his family 
just just went through the ring. I mean, really. And he saw all this. Why? Because <clears throat> he didn't obey the voice of the Lord. <clears throat> Excuse me. <clears throat> any comments or thoughts or questions on any of these so far? I guess go. <clears throat> you know, I think probably what motivates people to go contrary to this counsel that the Bible has given us is that they say that well, these people that are telling me this, and I'm looking from a young person's perspective because that's where a lot of this comes from, and they'll say, well, this older person is giving me good advice, but that is that advice is of a general nature, and uh, and they want they're trying to keep a lid on things, mm -hmm. and uh, I want to have some fun. And I want to walk close to the line of, uh, and, and, and live, live a little dangerously because that's where the excitement is, mm -hmm. is living a little dangerously, living uh, just off the edge of, uh, of uh, the precipice, so to speak. And, and that's, where, that's where the excitement is. And, and I think this carries through even to older ages. We say, you know, uh, I'm missing something. Mm -hmm. by not uh, uh, doing some of these uh, things or failing to do some of these things. I I'm, missing some, I'm missing something that's new. And then you have, mm -hmm. uh, like, like, like the, the lesson says, you have people coming by and telling you that there's something new. And, you know, we're, we're, uh, I remember when you used to buy cars and it used to say, the new and improved. Well, new and improved don't always go together. It's new, but it's not necessarily improved. But that's a good selling point. So we're always looking for something new and, and a, an edge that somebody else doesn't have. We're always looking for, for, for something that will be an experience that we haven't had before. And it's very tempting, but it's very dangerous. Exactly. And, you know, and it's easy for someone to look back and for someone who's hearing to say, Moses, you're yesterday's news. You know, Paul, you know, you're washed up. You're about to have your head cut off anyway, so why should I listen to you? It's really easy to just dismiss what somebody has to say. <clears throat> but everything that they've said in their, in their closing arguments, if you want to call it that, everything they've said is truth. And that's what can't be denied. What you, you know, the point is, what you said about, well, you know, you just want to keep me from having fun. You had, okay, David, you had your, you had your fling. Why can't I have mine? Because, you knucklehead, this is what's going to happen. You know, don't you understand? You don't get it? You know, it, it's sort of like, I should have had a V8. Uh, <laughs> yes, sir. I'm just thinking about, even though it's so much easier if we can learn from the heads-up approach, but most, a lot of our lingo today, you talk about how do you learn school of hard knocks. Well, that's learning from your consequences, you know, mm -hmm. and uh, trial and error. What does that mean? You know, same thing, you know, but it's the, it's the pride of human nature. <clears throat> I, need, I need my shot at getting it wrong first, too. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. And, you know, there's, there's just so much there. <clears throat> and to be perfectly honest, you know, I'm one of those, it's like, yeah, I, I know that. I, I've read this, but, you know, I just need to do what I need to do kind of a thing. Yes, Bob? Well, this thing about the watch, and especially using the uh, example of the baseball person in the stands, but he put himself in that situation to be able to be there. <clears throat> mm -hmm. Our human nature puts us in positions to be hit, but yet God's word is eternal. And so each one of these men have learned by putting themselves in the positions that they put them in. And they learn from the positions they put them in. They're trying to tell others, don't, don't sit in that right field mm -hmm. area because when a foul ball comes, you're going to get hit. No, I won't get hit. I'm going to go sit there. Yeah. And you know, one of the good examples using baseball again as an example, how many have been to baseball games at 
with Pelican's Plate. A lot of people have it. Okay. If you were <clears throat> if you were sitting watching the game and way on the far right field, there's an area that's set up for um, this this like a it's like a kitchen area, it's like a barbecue area and stuff. And I remember <clears throat> we had a bank I worked for had a, had an outing one time. And sure enough, we took over that area back there. And, uh, you know, they were serving up, you know, hot dogs and barbecue and hamburgers and all kinds of stuff. And served other, other things as well, which many people imbibed in. And, and, uh, um, but when the game got going and people are sitting there half out of their minds because they've had too much to drink, and someone hits a foul ball in the far right field, where does it go? You say, heads up, huh? Okay, and this is, a, you know, what you just said about people put themselves in these positions. And it's, you know, to sit there and the foul ball comes and thankfully it misses everybody. And this happened a couple of times, you know, hits the cement, whack. That could have been your head. But do the people think that? It's like, oh, cool. <laughs> no. What's the matter with you? There's a warning here. You know, wh what are you doing? And, and, and so, you know, that's what, you know, all these people have gone through this before. Learn, don't, oh, anyways. <laughs> yes, Bill. I can remember a time, and I'm sure this still goes on in some churches, but even in good churches, they used to romanticize uh, people who were sinners that had been saved from a, a rather sordid <clears throat> background. And I'm, at the time I was involved in stuff, uh, you know, I said, wait a minute, this is, this is not really right to do. You know, you don't, you don't need to uh, expand on someone's testimony. They can just, it's enough, should be enough just to say, listen, I came from a bad background and Christ saved me. But it used to be, and, and I'm sure it still is in some places, they used to go into all the gory details mm -hmm. and almost romanticize a, a, a background uh, away from the Lord. I guess they would feel like they were proving how great the grace of God is, which is pretty sorry because you don't need to do that. But they were, they were just trying to show you, look at all this stuff this guy's been saved from. But I'm going to tell you what, you, there's a danger in expanding on Stuff like that, it doesn't come without its cost, testimony wise. Yeah, it's interesting to say that. It's interesting. David never said to Solomon, you know, this is what I did. He said, no, he said, obey the voice of the Lord. You know, the law of Moses, you know, follow the testimonies and the statutes, stick to this stuff. You know, and it's almost like not that what he did was inconsequential. But if you focus on what you need to be doing as opposed to, you know, don't go in the direction I did. I mean, it's kind of like, you know, you, you want your testimony. I was this. Now I am this. And sometimes people will say, well, you know, like you said, tell me more. What, were you, you know, what was it like when you were, no, <laughs> please, I don't want to go there. Yeah. And, and exactly, yeah, yeah, I want to stay away from that. But so... Okay, the hearers of the messages. What were the reactions of the hearers of the messages? And we talked a little bit about that. Um, did they take the messages to heart? Or did they duck and cover? Um, we know that Moses and Joshua's audiences didn't listen very well, at least not for very long, because we have the Book of Judges, one of the most horrible books to read about you know, what people do um, when they turn from the Lord. Did Solomon listen? Maybe for a little bit, but he slipped it in. Um, you don't have to necessarily turn there, but in De the book of Deuteronomy, then back in 17, there were instructions. Okay, and now and we'll read some more about Solomon. Um, in verses 16 and 17, the instructions were from the Lord. You know, when that, when when you come into the land and you have um, and, and you have a king over you. In verse 16. It says that he, speaking of the king, shall not multiply horses to himself, nor cause the people to return to Egypt to the end that he should multiply horses. 
For as much as the Lord hath said unto him, ye shall henceforth return no more that way. In verse 17, neither shall ye he multiply, speaking of the king, and everyone knows what I'm going to say here, neither shall he multiply wives to himself that his heart turn not away. Neither shall he greatly multiply him to himself silver and gold. Now I think about <clears throat> Solomon, First Kings tells us that he received 666 talents of gold per year. Talk about multiplying gold. Silver, silver was like this, you could pave the streets with it, it was so, it was so uh, plentiful. And it, and it said that um, um, he had brought back horses from Egypt. These are, he did exactly what he wasn't supposed to do. What it says in Deuteronomy is that the king should do is to read the law. and re, I think it even says to rewrite it. That shall be with him, and he shall read therein all the days of his life, that he may learn to fear the Lord his God, to keep all the words, and so forth. <clears throat> so he's supposed to be reading the law. What's Solomon doing? 700 wives, 300 concubines. And what did they do? They led his heart away from the Lord to follow God. Um, so did the people listen? Mm, maybe not. So, so we all know that Second Peter and, and, and Jude and, and, and Second and Third John have warnings in them. What has modern Christianity done with the war, with these warnings? It's just one of those things to think about. Because look at the look at the directions of different churches. What is what is what have people done with all the warnings? Do they listen to them at all? The question is, okay, we can sit there and point fingers at everybody else. Okay, what am I doing with the warnings? What are we doing with them? Are we gonna stick with you know with what, what the Lord has for us and his word? Um, kind of read it faithfully? And you're going to check out what somebody else says. A lot of times people post stuff on Facebook. And it's wonderful sometimes to you know, see, wow, that's, that's, really, that's, that's pretty good. But sometimes people post things and it's like, where did that come from? That's not any Bible I've ever read. And, and you know, so you really need to, you need to listen to the warnings and pay attention to them. Um, and <clears throat> there are three different books that, that I was looking at in terms of, besides Matthew and Henry, which goes back to the 1500s. Um, about all these things. One of them was written in 1984, another one in 1996, another one in 2005. So that's 37, 25, and 16 years ago. Nothing changed. Nothing changed from the time the Bible was written to the time these books were written and said, and they all say the same thing. Things are not well with the church today because people aren't reading the warnings and they're not listening to the warnings. So... By the way, next week, Danny's going to tell us everything we need to know about him. <laughs> um, I'm not sure if anybody's here to listen to him. Um, yeah, there's, a, there's a bunch of folks who are going to be going to the Couples Conference at the Wilds next week. But, uh, but Danny, Danny will have some wonderful, wonderful stuff for us out of Second Peter. Um, but any other, any other comments or thoughts? Just Danny. He's talking about, how the, about the modern day church, Christianity. I think Second Timothy, he, he kind of just mentioned it in four two. He says, preach the word, begins it in season, out of season, reprove, rebuke, and exhort with all long suffering doctrine. Peter, I mean, Jesus, the inspiration of Paul, was telling us, and telling Peter that and Timothy as, as a preacher, three things he's supposed to do. Reprove, rebuke, and exhort. Those are three action words. Mm -hmm. Two of them are negative, one is positive. So often you see in a church, especially in a more liberal church, you never see any type of negative preaching or anything else, all exhortation. Mm -hmm. It's all building up, building up, building up, building up. Most of these, when you're talking about the warnings, Moses, mm -hmm. um, uh, David, even Solomon in his book of Ecclesiastes and Proverbs, uh, Paul, Jesus, Peter, John, Jude, everybody, they're, they're giving these warnings. There's negative teachings. And even Jesus himself spoke more about uh, hell and consequences than he did about heaven and good things. Right. 
Uh, the human nature is to always gravitate towards what it wants. It needs to be hot and negative things to keep it in line with what the Bible teaches. It goes along with absolute truth. You talk about absolute truth. What we can say is absolute truth, and nobody will argue it, actually, they still argue, uh, is mathematics. <clears throat> That's pretty much an absolute truth. Mm -hmm. You have one apple in this hand, one apple in this hand. How many apples do you have? Three. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, it's, 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 it's a new math. Yeah. <laughs> it's an absolute truth. You don't have any more than what you have. And it's the Bible that's the Bible, and it's absolute truth. You can't, you can't add to it, you can't take away from it. People try to because they want to make it fit the way they want it to fit. But it's an absolute truth, and it's finished, it's complete. And by doing anything to it, adding to it, taking away from it, uh, Revelation uh, tells you what. Happen to you by doing that. I just wanted to get a little bit of heads up. That's, that's another there one. Just heads up. Yeah. There's a heads up for you. Yeah. Yeah, where is it? Thank you. And any, any, other, any other thoughts? While you're at it, Danny, why don't you close us in a word of prayer, please? Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord Father, for the warnings that are in the Bible. Thank you, Father, for the truth of the Bible and its absoluteness. Father, thank you for Jesus. Thank you, Lord, for what he did on Calvary's tree and shedding his blood, Father, that we would have remission of sin. And one day we could see you in your holiness, Lord, and mm. stand beside you and worship you in true worship. Father, we thank you, Lord, for this lesson. Thank you, Lord, for the privilege to be able to spend time in your work. And Lord, now I pray you bless it. Bless the time together in the service to follow in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you all very much. Thank you.